there are three reasons why Bitcoin is currently under $19,000. I'm going to show you all three reasons here, right here today on the show. I'm also going to show you this pattern that's playing out. You can see this Adam and Eve playing his pat this Adam and Eve pattern, which we spoke about yesterday, is actually playing out. We're going to see where that's going to be going. And then I've got someone coming on the show who called this bear market from the start, and he's going to give you his forecast for exactly when this bear market ends. Let me tell you, when I saw it, I was absolutely shocked. I want to know what you feel. So you let me know what you feel. That's coming up at the end of the show. Make sure you are there. You are going to be so shocked when you hear about these targets. I was so shocked. I didn't even feel like doing the show. So let's do this. I'm just dying to know who's coming on. Carl, are you dying to know who's coming on? Yeah. I'll tell you, if I tell you the guy called the bear market from the beginning, nobody listened to him. Everybody just ignored him. He was spot on. He has three forecasts. He has a good scenario, a bad scenario, and an ugly scenario. And at the end of the show, we're going to listen to his scenario. So it's going to be a big show. Also, look, you can see that this Adam and Eve is playing out exactly like we said it would yesterday. There's your little Adam. And uh, you can just show the Adam and you can, you can see the Eve. And now it's playing out exactly like we said. And then this Adam and Eve should end somewhere where that line is. Carl, where is that line? Maybe you just walk us through the charts. Um, okay, so essentially you have, it broke obviously down this uh, area that we said yesterday, if it breaks below that, it will confirm the bearish continuation, especially once you lost that area on the left-hand side. I personally was hoping that there would be a little bit of a bounce to um, like, you know, go live with the community and show them a short position into there, but it, it didn't make it. I looked on Ethereum for something similar and it got very, very close. I put it out on Twitter because I obviously wasn't go, able to go live in time. And it wicked almost into the yellow. But it's exactly the same. A lot of the altcoins are doing exactly the same thing. And yeah, I would expect that it's going to at least come down Ethereum to about 950, probably even to the lows at 886. Um, and then for Bitcoin, you're looking at your, your target below at 17.6 to 18K. So I do think it will play out. It looks that way so far. So, I mean, this is you muted. Uh, so I'm saying this is we now visiting El, El Capo's targets. He was talking about sixteen, seventeen thousand. Is this hammer time? Is this the real hammer time? Hammer time. Man. Hammer time. We're ready. We hammer time. Okay, so this yeah. is hammer time. Hopefully, we can just get to the bottoms, get it over and done with, and then uh, get on with the show. Get on with the show. That's what we want to do. All righty. So listen, lot, we've got a lot to talk about. Big show. So I'm going to fly really, really quickly, but it's an important show. So you got to make sure you listen to every single part. Do me a favor though. Smash the like button. We're getting shadow banned. Yesterday, we, yesterday our video was shadow banned. Fun, fun, fun. Um, smash the like, subscribe, leave a comment, leave a good comment down below because that's how we're going to get uh, unshadow banned and then this video is going to get um, uh, distributed again. Yesterday was an absolute disaster from YouTube's part. All righty. And remember, at the end of the show, I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you something disgusting at the end of the show. I'm going to show you what the US government is doing with your Coinbase data. I'm going to show you what Coinbase is doing with your data and how Coinbase is giving your data to the government. We have to talk about that. I wasn't going to talk about that, um, but I have to talk about that. We have to talk about that. But that we'll only talk about after we look at the reasons why Bitcoin is crashing. Now, we saw that the Adam and Eve uh, had played out or is playing out exactly like uh, we said yesterday. Um, that was after the head and shoulders was invalidated. We're now moving into a new pattern, which is this Adam and Eve. And yeah, we had Bitcoin now struggling to... Uh, hold the 19,000, under 19,000, 18,910. And that is, there are a couple of things that have been happening. There are a couple of things that have been happening which which got us here. So the first thing that, that has happened is we got a um, rejection of the Bitcoin ETF uh, proposal from Grayscale. So remember Grayscale filed, um, Grayscale have the GBTC trust, which is the biggest holder of Bitcoin in the world. It's a trust that holds Bitcoin. And they wanted to convert that GBTC trust into the world's first ETF. And remember that that trust has, is trading at 30, now 30% 30 under its net asset value. And the SEC had until the 6th of July to come back to Grayscale and tell Grayscale whether they would make it into a, uh, a, the, the world's first Bitcoin spot ETF or whether it could be rejected against. And the SEC had until the 6th of July to do this. 
Anyway, the SEC came out before the 6th of July, which is very uncharacteristic of the SEC. But remember, in the United States, it's a long weekend this weekend. So Monday is the 4th of July. So most people aren't working on the 4th of July. Jimmy doesn't want us to work on the 4th of July because he wants oh, to take a wow. day leave. But we will probably be on the 4th of July just because we want Jimmy to work on the 4th of July. <laughs> but anyway, so what we know is we know that the, that the SEC declined this application. They declined it in a 40-page document or even longer than 40 pages. In fact, let's see how long this document is. 46 pages. I read the document. There are a couple of things that you need to look at here. You need to look at the fundamental reason why the SEC is declining the rule change. So remember, all they need to do to approve this is they need a rule change. And there's, we need to look at the fundamental reason why the SEC is declining the rule change. And the, the reason why they are disapproving or, or declining the rule change revolves around kind of one major issue. And the issue is around price manipulation. So it says the audit disapproves the proposed rule change. When considering the proposal, uh, blah, 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 they, they go on and they, they talk about what they said about when considering the proposal. In this segment, they talk about market surveillance across world, worldwide markets. And they're saying, look, because there's no shared market surveillance agreements across worldwide markets, there is a risk of big time market manipulation here. And um, they're saying that the market that they need cross-border significant agreements for surveillance before they're going to approve any kind of uh, Bitcoin ETF. That means that it's going to be a long time before we get an ETF because imagine cross-border transactions, uh, imagine countries cross-border signing a market surveillance agreement in crypto just because of an ETF. I don't think that the majority of countries or, 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 or big players are actually going to agree to that. And if they did agree to that, what would that mean for the ethos of crypto and the decentralization part of it? All what we want is we want this to be under gov out of government control and by giving them surveillance rights, which I'll show you in a second just how scary the surveillance rights actually are, that's a, 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 a massive thing. So the problem is now that if you think about this, the SEC declined this, but this is an, an ETF that was what was proposed sometime in October last year. And so it's been with the SEC since October last year. The SEC had until the 6th of July to approve it. They didn't approve it. Big problem. Big, 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 big problem. So what are SEC doing? The SEC are now filing a lawsuit. It's a grayscale are now filing a lawsuit against the SEC. I mean, that's unprecedented. I don't think that there is precedent where the SEC does its job in its discretion, which it can do, providing it has full legal reasons or because they can justify it by legal reasons, are declining the, SEC, uh, the, the, the ETF conversion. And now, Grayscale are filing a, um, a lawsuit against the SEC. So Michael Sonnenschein was on um, uh, CNBC today. Just listen to what he said. Is there a precedent for this sort of action to sue the SEC for a rejection? Well, Melissa, it's been a busy 12 hours for the Grayscale team. Of course, last night getting the SEC's decision, we were, of course, very disappointed. But as an organization, we were ready. Um, regulators do get sued, um, and it does happen frequently. Last night, after receiving the SEC decision, our attorneys almost immediately filed a petition for review with the appellate court in D.C., and that starts the litigation process contesting the SEC's decision, which we, of course, vehemently disagree with. What is the core uh, thrust of that, of that suit? Um, if you can just give me sort of the elevator pitch, so to speak, on, on why the SEC is wrong in this decision. Well, we've laid out these arguments throughout uh, the last couple of months leading up to this decision, um, really looking at the fact that the SEC is acting arbitrary and capricious by continuing to approve Bitcoin futures-based ETFs while continuing to deny spot Bitcoin ETFs. And when you look at the Administrative Procedure Act, which is really what governs the way that regulators have to govern, they have to be treating like issues alike. And in this case, they're not. They're actually discriminating against issuers like Grayscale who are trying to, you know, bring a product further into the U.S. regulatory perimeter here. Okay, so, Is there so that's the, 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 the leg which they're going to. Now, remember that Grayscale have been prepared for this. They were probably expecting 
this to be declined, even though they put on a brave face and said we're relatively confident. They were probably expecting it. And you'll remember that slightly earlier this year, um, on the June 7th, this month, they hired, we have retained a lawyer called Donald B. Varelli Jr. And he's a former solicitor general counsel of the United States um, as additional legal counsel. So they were kind of ready for this. They said, <clears throat> this was obviously their warning and said, and saying, look, if you, um, if you don't approve the ETF, just know that you got this uh, Donald Duck guy coming after you. Sorry, did I say Donald Duck? I meant Donald. Um, okay, you got this guy coming after you. Um, and so that's, that's the position now. Now they're starting to sue the SEC. The irony here is that GBTC are selling about 35 Bitcoin per day to pay their expenses. Now, I wonder who's going to be fitting the, the legal bill for the conversion into an ETF. It's going to be, I don't think it's going to be Grayscale. It's going to be the holders of the Grayscale GBTC Trust as part of their costs are going to be funding this legal battle. And if we do get into a legal battle now, chances are that these legal battles can go on for, I think, a minimum of, of 18 months. I don't think that we can get a GBTC ruling in less time than the SEC versus the, the Ripple, for example, or XRP. So, sorry, the SEC versus Ripple. So we're now in a position where if Grayscale do sue the SEC, that's an 18-month battle. Minimum, minimum, minimum. That's an 18-month battle, which is going to cost holders in the GBTC trust a whole lot of money. And in those 18 months, the question is whether we could get another ETF approved sooner. I was thinking about it earlier today. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that the SEC is going to approve any kind of spot ETF product for as long as Gary Gensler is in charge. And if Gary Gensler remains in charge, and he is due to remain in charge for, for quite a while longer, then chances are we're not going to get a Bitcoin spot ETF approved. And so even though Grayscale are now taking the long road and the harsh road and the tough road and the hostile road, maybe it's going to be the only chance. There's not, it's not to say that they're going to win uh, it's not to say that they're going to win by any stretch of the imagination because we're in unprecedented times of people challenging the SEC for declining an ETF uh, proposal. So that's where we stand on the ETF proposal. The problem is that we now have a problem. We have the majority, the most Bitcoin, in the, the, the largest holder of Bitcoin is holding onto its Bitcoin. So you've got Grayscale and they're holding onto their Bitcoin. Um, and they're not selling because you can't sell their Bitcoin. And this Bitcoin is trading at a massive, massive, massive discount to the net asset value. It's trading at a 30% discount to the net asset value. So some people are asking for this fund to be liquidated, for the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust to be liquidated and to then take the proceeds from the liquidation and buy the shares back and basically give everybody the money. What they're not realizing is if Grayscale start liquidating 13 or $14 billion worth of Bitcoin to start repaying or rebuying back shares in the trust, then we've got a massive problem. So now we're kind of caught between rock and a hard place. Peter Schiff says, if Sun and Shine really wanted to close the GBDC 30% discount to NAV, he, would have, he wouldn't file a doomed lawsuit. And I agree, it's probably a doomed lawsuit. He'd sell the Bitcoin owned by the GBTC trust and use the proceeds to buy back the shares. That would reduce his AUM and lower his fees. And fees are important to shareholders. And I agree. Problem is, and would have a forced sell onto the market. And right now, when I look at the Bitcoin price, I don't think that this market can handle any more forced sellers. This would be another, you want to call it forced seller, forced liquidation, uh, et cetera. So right now, it's a very bad case situation. It means that we're probably a year and a half away from the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust minimum being converted into a, uh, an ETF, if ever. Um, and right now, holders who are holding this Grayscale GBTC Trust, who may have paid 100% premium. Some of these people paid 100% premium to the price of Bitcoin. In July 2017, this thing was trading at 100% premium. You understand how crazy that is? People who are buying Bitcoin at 100% premium, those poor people are now, if they were holding, are now at a 30% discount. So not only did you lose on the price of Bitcoin and, and, and everything else, you lost on the premium to discount, which is absolutely crazy.
What I do know for sure is that at some point, terminal point, the discount has to go away. And if your, uh, if your time horizon is long enough, then buying GBTC is a great alternative to buying Bitcoin. Yes, I know it's not, not your keys, not your Bitcoin, you're not holding the keys, but eventually they have to do something with this fund. Either they have to liquidate it or they have to make it an ETF or something, but it cannot continue to trade under net asset value from now until the end of time. It's not the same as a normal fund that trades under net asset value because it's not a diversified fund. There's only one asset in this fund. The only asset in this fund is Bitcoin. There's no other assets in the fund. Usually, there are funds that trade at a discount to net asset value, but those are usually funds that are holding a diversified range of assets. And so users are saying, look, because it's diversified, we don't really want that. We do want that. So it's trading slightly under net asset value. But when a fund is only holding one asset, then for the fund to trade under net asset value just sounds, I don't know, a little bit crazy. Anyhow, that's where it is. So that is the first reason for the price decline. The second reason for the price decline, I think, is what's going on in Europe. So what's going on in Europe is after months of negotiation, they agreed with the most ambitious travel rule for transfers in crypto assets in the world were agreed to in Europe. And what the rules in Europe say that all crypto asset provider becomes obliged under the money laundering rules um, to, to capture the KYC basically from wallet to wallet. So this is like a really worst case scenario where any crypto transaction, they even go as far as to say the regulation will also apply to transfer to and from unhosted wallets and will be required to collect information and apply enhanced due diligence measures with respect to all transfers involving unhosted wallets on risk basis. Verification of identity of the beneficial owner and the unhosted wallet will be mandatory for large transfers above a thousand euro. So above a thousand euro, we've got a big problem. So that's the second reason why I think today uh, the Bitcoin price is going down. And then lastly, why I think the Bitcoin price is going down. And soon remember, we're going to bring on someone to show you where it's going down. The last reason why the Bitcoin price is going down is because of this minor capitulation. Remember I said to you that when we get under $20,000, the problem is that miners are going to start capitulating because above $20,000, miners can afford to repay the loans that they took on their machines. So for those of you who don't understand what I mean, when miners buy Bitcoin machines, they finance the Bitcoin machines. So they take leverage against the Bitcoin machines and they say, look, I know that I'm going to generate X amount of Bitcoin out of this machine every single month uh, as an average. And I know the, the average price of Bitcoin is going to be whatever the number is. And they say, okay, well, let me take the number of Bitcoin that I'm going to generate. Let me multiply it by the number of, uh, of um, or let me multiply it by the price. And then I know more or less what I can expect to pay to repay the loan on my machine. And so they go and buy, instead of buying one machine, they get leveraged and they buy 100 machines and they take leverage around 100 machines. And that's all good and well when your cost of production around a Bitcoin is around 20,000 and you can sell it for 30,000 or 40,000 or 50,000. So right now, the cost of production on a Bitcoin around, depending where you are and how much energy you're paying, it's around $20,000. So you think about Bitcoin being produced at $20,000. And the price of Bitcoin is now under $20,000, which means that any miner that is less efficient than the best is starting to bleed money. They're starting to bleed money. That's a big problem. It's, it's, a, it's another forced liquidation. What is the liquidation? The liquidation is any miner that has been holding their Bitcoin that they've mined as part of their profits is now going to have to liquidate their assets so that they can pay the, their machines. Bloomberg estimated that there were about $4 billion worth of miners, minor loans which are coming under stress. Now that we had Bitcoin breaking down under $20,000 again, what are we seeing? We're seeing the miners capitulate. We're seeing the miners have to start dumping their Bitcoin. They started this in May. Look, there was a huge, huge, huge um, uh, uh, dump in May. And you can probably see it better over here. Where, look, from May, all the Bitcoin miners actually started to distribute their, the Bitcoin, which they accumulated over here. Why are they distributing? Because that's the only way they can afford to repay their machines. That's the only way they can afford to pay the loans on their machines. That is why the miners are, are, are now capitulating. Big problem. Let's look at the maths. So this guy, his name is Jaron Mulard. 
what he did was he broke down all the minor costs. He broke down the minor costs into direct costs, um, uh, fixed costs, operating, direct costs, indirect costs. And what he's saying here is he's saying if you take the public minus direct cost of production, 3,848, he looks at all of them. And he, he shows Stronghold, Argo, these are all miners. And he's showing what their fixed costs are. Then he's, he takes a look and he says, let's look at their monthly operating cash flow. Okay, so he takes the operating cash flow and he, he ranks them by operating cash flow. And then he looks at the cash outflows. The cash outflows are also important. And then he looks at the remaining machine payments. How, many, how much more money do they have to pay? Now, what you can see here is that Marathon has a lot of money that they need to be paying. Marathon has the most. They have $260 million that they need to pay. How are they going to repay it? Let's look at Marathon over here. So you, you take Marathon, they've got $250 million to pay. They um, have monthly operating, um, uh, operating cash flow of 7.1. So they need to use that to pay the machines. And, and then you look at how leveraged the miners are. And it, I mean, long story short, when you take a look at all of this data together, what you realize is that the miners are highly, highly, highly leveraged. And the problem is leverage is very cool. When you're making a lot of money, when you can, you can set up a good operation and you can mine lots of Bitcoin and you're making money on each machine, you buy and buy and buy and buy more machines. Now you've bought all the machines, but the price goes down. The price goes down. Your production costs remain higher than the money that you're making. And now you're starting to lose money, but you owe money on the machines. So you can't really switch off the machines because any money is good money, but you're in a deficit every month. So what do you do? You go and you have, you have to start selling your your um, your coins. And that's where the miners are. So now another, uh, you know, like we've just had so, ma so many forced sales, so many forced sales. We had Doquan forced sale. We had Three Arrows Capital forced sale. We had Celsius forced sale. Now we've got miners forced sale. So there's just like, it's an, it's, what it is, is another form of leverage. That's all it is. It's just another form of leverage. This time it's leverage to buy uh, mining machines. And as you can see, what's happening now is we're just unwinding all the leveraged, the, unwinding all the leverage in a high leverage market. Now, don't get me wrong. Re leverage is an amazing tool, but responsible leverage is an amazing tool. Irresponsible leverage is not an amazing tool. And the problem is that in markets where people get greedy, they start taking irresponsible leverage. So you've got to be careful that in the next bull market, you don't take irresponsible leverage because I know some of you in this market took irresponsible leverage, right, Jimmy? Jimmy took irresponsible leverage. I watched him the other day. He, he, had, yeah. he had made $1.60 on his Cardano and he was leveraged. It's irresponsible. He told me today he's moved back to paper trading now because <laughs> yeah, it's not going well. Oh, has he gone to paper trading now? No, my trading is going well. Yeah, but? But uh, I just don't like this range read. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> All right, so that's that. Then um, there was a very interesting, we, we saw yesterday that uh, MicroStrategy bought a whole lot of Bitcoin. They bought 480 Bitcoin. And um, what that has done is it, it, CZ said, you know, maybe a lot of people are going to laugh at Michael Saylor, but he who gets the, laugh, the last laugh laughs the loudest, basically. Uh, look, I, I don't know. I was thinking about the Michael Saylor thing today. Love Michael Saylor. I think what he's done for the Bitcoin space is unparalleled. And I think to get someone with so much conviction is a gift. It's the hero we, we don't deserve, but we, we managed to get this hero with a listed company that's gone in with all conviction. But if you think about what Michael Saylor has done, he's also leveraged. He may not be leveraged in the bank or to a bank or to debtors, but he is leveraged. Because he's taken his entire net worth and he's taken his entire company's net worth and his company's taken Bitcoin secure debt and he is leveraged to the hilt when it comes to Bitcoin. Now, one of two things happens here. If Bitcoin succeeds, like we all hope it's going to succeed and think that it's going to succeed, then Michael Saylor becomes a trillionaire and maybe becomes one of the first trillionaires in the world. But if this doesn't succeed, Michael Saylor goes to zero. Now, obviously, we all think that there is a better chance of success than failure here. That's why we do what we do. We think there's a much bigger chance of success than failure. We are almost certain inside ourselves that Bitcoin will emerge because it has emerged every single time. But there have been things in history that should have worked and didn't work. Just should have worked but didn't work. 
And if Bitcoin is one of those things, then I don't know how people are going to look at Michael Saylor. Now, again, I say, I really applaud his conviction. I think we really need someone with that kind of conviction. But I think being all in on crypto, taking, you know, your, he said the only thing he owns is a house and a little bit of furniture and, and, and Bitcoin. That is, by any stretch of the imagination, no matter how you look at it, that is probably an irresponsible place to be. And today, uh, today, he was on Chris's show from MM Crypto, a good friend of our channel. And I mean, just listen to him. The guy has so much conviction. Never seen anything like it. This is for someone who has, I mean, just for perspective. He has an average price of $30,000 per Bitcoin, okay, on, on a $4 billion position. So $4 billion position and he's one third down. So he's $1.5 billion down, give or take. He's $1.5 billion down. And here is how he speaks and feels about it. Both. Two hours before this recording, actually, MicroStrategy announced that they bought more Bitcoin. And then CZ from Binance retreated and he said, some people might be laughing, but I think in the end, Michael Saylor is the one laughing. And um, I have to agree, I think that was an awesome buy today. Around 20,000 um, people <laughs> were screaming for like 20,000. Now that we are there, everyone is like, oh, we are going lower. So I want you to talk about... If we go lower, will MicroStrategy buy even more? Um, what is the game plan? Why did MicroStrategy buy? What's going to happen if we drop even lower? A topic, a topic I really wanted to touch and a topic many people are interested in. You know, well, yesterday I tweeted, stay humble, stack sats, in an homage to Matt O'Dell and, and all of the, the Bitcoiners uh, who have known for the past decade that if you're if you're going to arrive early uh, to a revolutionary uh, technology that's uh, and the first digital commodity that's monetized in the history of the world, you're going to be in for a bumpy ride. So Bitcoin has has been a continually bumpy ride for the past you know many many years. I think uh, even since we got in the market, it's gone through nearly three cycles. And the only rational way to approach this is dollar cost averaging. So micro strategies, in essence, just dollar cost averaging into Bitcoin. Our strategy is we acquire Bitcoin, we hold Bitcoin, uh, and we just happen to believe that 100 years from now, uh, Bitcoin is like Manhattan, and you're just going to want to hold as, as many blocks of Bitcoin as you can. Um, <clears throat> you know, if you acquired Manhattan in 1907, in 1913, in 1917, in 1921, in 1928, 1932, and 1947, and then another thing in 1953 and 57, and you ask someone, you know, what was the right time to buy, and do you regret having bought, you know, the top? I, I can't even remember which of those years were going to be the most efficient times to buy. Generally, the view is that once you find a good thing, you just want to consistently acquire more as cash flows allow you. So our strategy is simple. Is, right? We acquire Bitcoin, we hold Bitcoin, we don't sell Bitcoin. Right? The only mistake you can make is acquire it with so much leverage that you get force liquidated uh, on a drawdown. And that's a mistake. You don't want to get stopped out. Uh, and then the other mistake is to stop acquiring right and uh and in this particular case if i look at all the options there's no better option bitcoin is the the least risky strategy that we can find if we're if we're acquiring real estate in africa or asia or south america what could go wrong there if we bought stocks there are plenty of stocks that are down 80 percent and if you bought something that, uh, you know, that's on the wrong side of some government policy, you know, then that can work against you. And, uh, you know, if we just kept buying gold, it's just going nowhere one way or the other. So I, I think that what you're seeing is micro strategy, just dollar cost averaging. So they just dollar cost averaging. If you want the full interview, it's available on Chris's channel on MM Crypto. And it's, I mean, legendary, legendary interview. If you get some time. Go and have a look at that. Go and have a look at that.
All right. Um, so coming up now, I've got someone who called the bear market from the beginning all the way down to the bottom. Every time there was a pump, he came out and he said, this is not the end. We're still going one more leg down. And today he's saying, this is not the end. We're still going one more leg down. So let us get our friend, our longtime friend, and someone who hasn't been on the channel for a long time, and we have missed him a lot. Our friend, Coach K. Brother, how are you? I'm great. How are you? Good, good, good. I want to call up some tweets. And I mean, I want to congratulate you on your conviction. Um, this is, I mean, these are just a couple. There have been a whole lot of tweets. You said, my last string of YouTube videos, you pretty much warned everybody that there's a bear market. That was four months ago, three months ago. You warned everybody. Uh, then, uh, I mean, well, there were, I mean, I, I see that you are up 12x on a short that you took at an entry price of uh, 42,000, 42,194. Apparently, that short is now $150 million in profit. Um, yeah, so, I mean, just walk us through why you were so confident and then walk us through where to from here. And I think maybe we should do it with a chart up on the screen because that's probably the best. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've, I, went, I went over this, I'll share my screen now, but basically I went over this uh, about five months ago. Actually, I made a tweet in the start of January. I said during Christmas, I think we're going to fake out um, and kind of break out and then fake out, which is this. Let me just make this a little bit bigger for you guys. Um, right here around Christmas, I was like, I think we're going to fake out. It's going to make people really bullish. So what happened was that's exactly what happened. Everyone was like, yeah, we're going to keep going to the moon. And I was like, man, we've been very bearish for quite some. Actually, it was right here. This is the Christmas time um, fake out. So I kind of called like it's probably going to fake out and break back down. It's exactly what happened. We had that uh, little rise. Everyone kind of get, get excited about a little bit higher lows, higher highs. Um, but the reality was the volumes dropped off. Um, you know, and I actually went down and I broke it, I broke it down more, but what I can do is I'll bring up the BLX chart on the weekly. Cause I broke this down like way, way back in the day, um, way back over in like December. And I was saying like, we're going to make a McDonald's pattern when we're right around the top and everyone said, yeah, you're retarded. And I was like, listen, like we look at market cycles and we look at how long from the top to the bottom on average. And so it's about a year. So I thought, you know, around November, we rhyme and repeat in this market over and over again. So our first cycle, you know, we had that first halving, we dumped, we kind of grow into the first halving right around December, January, November, which is what I was expecting to happen this time too. And if you look at the second cycle, the same thing happened. We bottomed out around December of that year, 14, we kind of went sideways and we kind of start breaking up into the halving. The last cycle we had, same thing. We got up an average of uh, 365 days. Then we went 518 days in the second cycle. There wasn't institutional money. There wasn't a Michael Saylor. So I, I was expecting that, you know, we're probably going to have a similar type of situation. So I started mapping this out a lot earlier and kind of talking about it. Well, you know, no one wants to hear bearish news. And the problem is for a lot of us is like, you never want to hear something you don't want to hear, but the reality is you should listen to people that are telling you from a non-emotional state of why this is going to potentially repeat. The same so thing happened. The same thing happened with Terra Luna. We had cognitive, we had a, a cognitive bias. We didn't want to hear that it was going to go down, so we didn't listen. So anyone who attacked Terra Luna was attacked, and that's how you were attacked on social media because people didn't want to hear it. You came out and you said, "Look, we're going down, guys," and. You, every time that there was a pump, you said, I don't trust the pump. And you kept getting the hate. Uh, yep. And here you are. You know what? Like the thing that you realize, and this is something all of you guys watching should understand, is when everyone is saying the same thing, and then you have someone, a few people that are looking at the marketing, not emotionally saying, I'm just going to dump because they wanted to. I don't want Bitcoin to dump. I've been in Bitcoin for like nine years. I want Bitcoin to pump as much as anybody else. But the reality is, it's not always just going to go up. It has to come and retrace down. And the craziest thing is I've had this chart up for months. You can even go back to tweets where I've even tweeted this exact same chart. Um, and I said, we're likely going to go to 17.5. We were literally right to the exact level that I drew on my chart months and months before, way before we were even close to being bearish. I was like, these are the levels that I see potentially us coming to while we were going up. 
And I was like, this isn't really a strong level, but on the daily, it's a little bit stronger. On the weekly, you don't really see how many times it's touched. So what I was saying is we kind of double topped. It's a McDonald's pattern. You know, you double top, you make an M and you keep going down. So, you know, and what I was looking at while I was saying that is how many days did it take us to get the top? Well, the first time it took a year. The second time it took 518 days. This time it took 579 days. But if you look at the actual volume, when we hit this top over here in April, May, um, you know, actually April, not May, well, before we dumped in May, after we came back and we started pumping again, we never had half of the volume we had on the way up. So it was kind of like someone was trying to push it. There was some positive news. There was a little Elon Musk stuff. There was Michael Saylor keeps pumping. That's what pump. happened in 17, coach. If you remember exactly. in 2018, we had the pump, we had the, the correction with Bitcoin, and then we got another pump, but we didn't get volume in the second pump. No, we didn't get volume in the second pump. And in the re reality is, is like, I saw that. And then I was looking at a macro, like, okay, markets stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. What that means is everyone knew that COVID happened. No one's working. Stocks are going crazy. Crypto's going crazy. Made no sense, but it's going to go as long as it's going to go. And I kept screaming at people in April and then in December and November, take profit, take profit, take profit, take profit. Even if you don't know why you should, but have dollars ready because this thing is going to eventually come back down. Um, you know, but no one wants to hear that. They think, oh, we're just going to keep mooning. I had people making bets. I have like 20 bets of people online that we were going to make a new all-time high this year. And I was like, this is the easiest money ever to make. I had a guy bet me a million dollars will go to 60K this year. And I was like, dude, you don't even have the money to take the bet. Because the reality is like, I don't do this out of emotion. I do this out of analysis. And so I expected us to come down to this level. And the reality is now I expect us potentially to have a different situation so i kind of drew this good bad and ugly chart. that's what i wanted to see is there any way yeah. you can make your screen slightly bigger just the let numbers are very tough to read yeah let me let me see if i can just kind of blow it up there we go yeah that, that's a bit bigger yeah there we go that a yeah sorry it's, i think my resolution is too high which is the problem but um so right, we've come down to 17.5 way too from here so here here we're at the we're at the good the good is like okay if we get to this level it's not the end of the world we never were going to come down. This is the level right here, 17.5, 17.6, whatever it is. Around that level was where I expected us to come. We've had that level there before on a, on a daily chart. So I was expecting we'll not just stop at all-time high. We're going to go to a level at least. So it's probably going to go to 17.5, which is why I was saying it, because all-time high has one touch ever. It never really stopped and touched it again. You know, So knowing that, it's very weak support. So it wasn't going to like become there. It's going to come down to 17.5. But then we have the bad and the ugly. And the bad and the ugly are just levels that if you go to the daily, you'll see them a lot clearer. But on a weekly chart, you can see it really clear that this is another level where we've come to in the past. It's 13, about 13 to 12. And then there's obviously the levels down here at 11. So I've been telling people my levels that I expect to come to next are likely between 11 and 14. And it sounds crazy, but we could actually even get ugly. And the ugly would be this capitulation event that even guys like Arthur Hayes are talking about happening on the 4th of July, which is in four days, um, where we could go all the way down to $8,000 again. And the reason why $8,000 is such a really important, prominent area is because we've come to that area and bounced and bounced and bounced up and down, whether we went higher or lower, we bounced off that level several times. So there's some strong support around 10, eight to 10 K. I personally don't think we're going to come that low. But it's possible. So I drew that as a scenario, and I plan it to so I don't fail. Like, why, to, why yeah. Fourth of July? Well, I mean, Fourth of July is Monday. That's like, yeah. Arthur Hayes made a huge like. It took like thirty minutes to read, but basically, what he's saying is like, there's all these factors that are going to come in. There's some, there's something going on with the traditional markets. I can't remember what what exactly it was. Um, that he was saying, but it was some some big event is going to happen in the traditional markets and it potentially is going to lead to like a massive dump. I don't really trade off of that. I just look at the chart and go, these are the levels that potentially could come to. I'm going to set my buy orders at those levels. And if it comes and we have a huge wick down and we bounce back up, awesome. But guys that are are buying, that doesn't mean we're just going to go up. He could be dollar cost averaging all the way down to 8K and still will win long term. We all know Bitcoin will go higher in the long term. But Bitcoin, one thing people are not talking about at all, when is the last time Bitcoin had a dump or sorry, the traditional markets had a dump like this ever 
in Bitcoin's history. It hasn't happened. We've had one huge dump for, for COVID. But if you look at the traditional market, it has not stopped going up since Bitcoin has been around other than 20, uh, 2008. We had this dump right here. But other than that, we've just been going up and up and up and up. And we do it with COVID, with no one working, with everyone stuck at home, with people getting free money, with inflation. It didn't make any sense. But the thing is, like I said, markets stay irrational longer than we can stay solvent. Meaning if you keep going against the market, you're going to not have enough money to keep going against the market. Michael Saylor is a different Coach, Coach yeah. Yeah. when will you close your short and when will you start going long? Let's get right. straight to it. So straight to it. When we get to the bad, I'll close about half if we get there. But I'll, what I've been doing all the way down is just going to levels like 30,000, 22,500. And I've been setting, um, just like kind of slowly trailing my short manually because I don't really want to stop out of the short if we go to the ugly because it's extremely profitable already. And I think it can be an even more profitable trade if I just leave it open. So and I'm where is your short relative to the price? So my short, I opened it. I was right. Like, no, where is your 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 stop loss relative to the price? You say you. you yeah, right now it's at this level around thirty k. It's just about, it's like wow, thirty thousand okay. exactly. So I have I want to keep myself room because I've been stopped out many times in the past. Um, I'm kind of inching it down towards this twenty seven area now because I'm seeing this two hundred EMA got rejected and now it's going further down, and we're like we're super bearish. The cloud's super far away. The Ichimoku is showing us that we should be pulling up at some point. And if we start to, if I start to see that, I'm happy to lose a little bit of the profit on this short. But if I'm right and this continues going down, the profitability is huge. Um, but the reality is I'm not doing it for the profit. I'm doing it because this is what I see happening. And it's a macro trade. Like I made that trade way back over here. I think it was like just around 420 when the price went up to 42,200 or whatever. That's when I was like, I'm about to go to bed. I'm like, I'm gonna open a short. This is, this is, looks like it's about to dump. And the next morning I woke up and I was up like a hundred thousand dollars or something. The point is that like, what, what I look at isn't about my emotion. I don't care where the market goes. I look at the chart and it tells me what I should do. So what should I be doing? Someone asked me, why didn't you close part of your short? I, I literally had it off by a hundred bucks. It's 17,500. It hit 17.6 and bounced. Will it go back there? The way the chart looks right now? Absolutely. It's going to go back there. Ethereum, the same thing. Ethan, Bitcoin are the exact same chart, basically. Uh, super bearish. And, you know, I don't see it any, any signs of stopping. Now, the RSI is like ready to reset and go, but it can go much lower. It could go all the way down to like eight or 10 before it resets on the weekly. On the daily, it's super bearish. It's gone down to like 17, but we we can go lower. So what, what the RSI is, is telling us the strength of the market. How many people do you know, Rand, that are buying anything right now other than guys like macro, MicroStrategy? I don't know a single person personally that is buying anything, regardless if it's ETH or Bitcoin or anything. Everyone is I'm just buying. shorting. I'm buying. buying Solana. I'm right. buying Bitcoin. I buy every day, every day, I, I, so, every day. So for me, I look at the level. So like if you go to Solana, right? So it's at 31, which seems quite cheap. The reality is there's these wicks here. And what wicks tell us is there's liquidity pockets. So why I'm looking for is that 24 to $20 zone first. But if that doesn't hold, we have another zone down here at like $12. So you can dollar cost average slowly. But right now I would take, I would tell people like if it was me, take your time. Don't be in a rush. I yeah, put all these. I put all these levels on my charts for every major crypto. These are levels where the prices could go to. And if they go there, you're going to be so happy. Look at the, my, my Adam one I did. And a week later, it was already in the zone, but it can go lower. Uh, the algo trade, it can go lower. The ABEX all right, coach, trade, coach, listen, yeah. I'm out of time, but I've got a good idea. Let's, yeah. let's do this again early next week. And let's actually go through all the charts. Let's not go through Bitcoin. Let's spend a whole show, me and you, Going through all the charts, all the buy zones, all the capitulation zones, all the stop losses. Is it, is it a date? Yeah, yeah, that's a date. Um, I'm here till the 4th at night, 5th. So we'd probably have to do that like on Monday. Otherwise, I might be traveling. Done. So. On Monday. On Monday, uh, uh, James, on the 4th of July, we're doing it on Monday. Monday, yeah. Coach K on banter, going through charts. That's what we're doing. Put it in your diaries, guys. Put it in your diaries. Coach, much love, brother. I know we haven't seen you for, for a long time, but much love, my, my man. Thanks, brother.
I actually missed that guy, bro. Yes. I missed that guy. He hasn't been. You know, he's been here since the beginning, and he hasn't been on for a long time. But I missed him. I remember watching. Right? I missed him. What a good guy. What a good guy. All right. Lastly, before we go, and we are out of time, but I do want to. Do, I, want, I want to show you something before we go. And I wasn't going to show you this because I don't want to show you shit in the bear market. But this is fucking important. Okay. And I'll show you why it's important. Uh, and really, 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 this is not a show. I am going to show you something, but it's not a show. And you'll see why in a second. Okay. So, look. This is the headline. Coinbase is reportedly selling user data to U.S. Immigrations and Customs Enforcement Agency, including geodata and transaction history. Okay, I didn't, I didn't make that up. It's there. You can see it. What are they selling? How do they know your geodata? They know it because of your IP address. If you're not using a VPN, the exchanges know exactly where you're logging in from, and they can sell the data to your own government. They can say, they can say, hey, look, every time Ran logs in, Ran is in South Africa, Ran is here, Ran is here, Ran is here, even if the account is not KYC. That is why I keep saying to you guys, you have to use a VPN. There is, here, Ran is here. Even if the account is not KYC. There is a referral link here for NordVPN. It costs $3 a month. Okay. And when you use a VPN, you can change where you are positioned. You pay $3 a month. I just want to show you how real this problem is. Because I know you probably don't believe me. I just want to make sure I'm not revealing any details. Just one second. Okay. So look, look, this is all my logins to Bybit. You can see that every time I log in, I'm changing the IP address. I was in South Africa on the same day. I was in Monaco. I was in Portugal. I was in the United Kingdom. I keep changing. And the reason why I keep changing is because I don't want them to know where I am. And the way to do that is so simple. Protect your crypto. Don't be caught. Don't let your data be given to any of the authorities. Just Go to NordVPN, get a VPN. It's $3 a month. And then your data, no one will know your data. And, you know, again, if you don't think that the exchanges knows, every single website that you are surfing is sending your IP. There it is. There's the IP address. There's the IP address. There's the IP address. But you see, mine are all different every time I log in. You know why mine are all different every time I log in? Because every time I log in, I set my VPN to a different place. They, they, this exchange has no idea where I'm at. They don't. They think I'm in Portugal one day, Monaco the next day, South Africa the next day, UK the next day. They don't know where I am. They don't know where I am. That is what you should be doing. If you're not doing that, you're not keeping your crypto safe. I didn't want to show this to you guys today because NordVPN our sponsors. They sponsor us uh, on our show. But when I saw this, my blood went, my blood boiled. And I just thought, these exchanges are getting the data and they're selling your data to the, the immigrations and customs enforcement people. If they're selling it to them, they're selling it to everyone else. Just do, do me a favor. I wish I could give it to you for free, but I can't. Just get yourself a NordVPN. It's $3 a month. You protect your crypto. Trust me. There's a referral link below. Use the referral link. You're getting a 70% discount. You don't. Just do it anyway, but get yourself a VPN. You don't like me. You don't like NordVPN. Get yourself another VPN, but get a VPN. Because if you're not getting a VPN, you are sharing your data. I will see you guys again tomorrow. Big banter tomorrow. Tomorrow's banter, Jim Bianco, Jeff Booth, and Alex Kruger. It's going to be a beast of a banter. See you guys again tomorrow. Until then, trade well, my friends. Wow, what a good show. Coach was fantastic. Fantastic. Yes, nice. Monday, Monday, Monday is me and coach, boys. Monday is the me and the coach.